All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Victor Sizanowskis. I'm one of the product managers here at, uh, at Aptis. And I'm pleased to introduce a fine panel of speakers that we have for this next session, which is called Rise of the Machines. Um, and it's really about, you know, you've probably heard a lot about uh, machine learning and, and our AI, and what does that mean for you in your businesses today? And so we've as uh, assembled really a great panel here to help us speak on those things today. So starting here on my left, we have Neil Hughes, who's a tech writer with, with Inc. and a number of other publications, and is really one of the experts in this area and is going to offer his insight. Um, next, we have Laren. No, I, I butchered that, didn't I? It's Lauren. Lauren <laughs> Hake, uh, who is the managing director of one of our great partners, HBR Consulting. Then we have our very own Elliot Yama, who is our AVP of Quote to Cash Intelligence and Machine Learning. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, we have David Baer, who's the VP of Text and Ad Analytics at Abbey. And they'll be walking us through a great presentation today. So I'll turn things over to Neil, who'll get us kicked off here. Oh, we've got to go, yeah? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to get out of the way. I think it's undoubtedly that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are big buzzwords at the moment. Uh, but I think that's also incredibly daunting for a lot of people. If you're not tech savvy or not tech minded uh, in the business world, it can be incredibly daunting. But I don't think that it needs to be. Uh, so the best way I try and make sense of this kind of thing is to demystify the technology. So if I was to think about the music industry, for example, I remember growing up as a small child and the love of vinyl records and caressing the, the vinyl on the way to the bus home and the artwork. But then that quickly changed to uh, cassettes and creating my own mixtapes and the passion that I had for that. And then obviously, then that evolved again onto CDs and the crystal clear quality of the music. And then finally, I suddenly had an MP3 player that I could could carry my entire record industry, uh, the entire record collection in my pocket. And if that wasn't enough, now we're in a situation where we have Spotify, we have iTunes Music, uh, where we can think of a song, as it pops in our head, we can play it straight away. But that's all great. But what about the data behind that? Because what I do now is I subscribe to something called uh, Song Kick. So for example, every song that I listen to, uh, gets beamed uh, into the Songkick, uh, the Songkick servers, and if that band plays in my city or an area where I am, I get an email straight away. So we don't think about the technology behind that, but it just shows straight away the power of our own listening data and our own preferences. But I think we need to go beyond that. Let's forget about the technology for a moment. If we actually think about uh, in our own homes, we have Netflix. Every TV show and film is personalized for us based on what we actually view. Same with Amazon. Amazon knows what we want to buy. It knows uh, what we might want to buy for our loved ones. And then anyone that's in a meeting room will probably find many watches or wearables or Fitbits. And their healthcare has now gone from being reactive where you wait for something to go wrong and then you go into the doctor's surgery to now we're being proactive where we've got our own health dashboards with the calories that we've consumed, the sleep that we've taken. And this is all data and machine learning and artificial intelligence behind it, unlocking our real habits. So if we look at this in the business world, it seems we've got two different worlds here because at home, everything's personalized and digitized for us. Uh, we, can, we can get a cab, a hotel room, our weekly shop, all done like that. And that is our expectation level now. But when we go into the workplace, it's completely different. Suddenly there's a lot of red tape and process that takes absolutely days, if not weeks, to complete. And if we look at the actual data behind this, in the workplace, 0.5% on average of all data is analyzed and used. So let's just try and think about that for a moment. We've got two different worlds here that are conflicting with each other. So if we don't talk about technology uh, as in machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're already measuring our own data and it's just we need to bring that into the workplace. The data within the workplace is equally as valuable. We don't want to wait anymore to get those results. And equally, I was chatting yes, only yesterday to the people at Reuters that were using uh, Aptus and they were saying that people actually 
Uh, the feedback that they had, and I remember this line uh, where they said, I enjoy doing business with you now because you make it easier. So that line really resonated with me because if that's happening at Reuters, what about the competition? If their competition doesn't offer that kind of service, they're, going, they're not going to go there because you want it straight away. And I think they had reduced their processes from 14 down to one. And as a result of that, they increased productivity uh, and efficiency. So the question I'd like you all to listen to, the question I'd like to ask everybody here today is, do you know the value behind your data? You know, if that 0.5% figure I, I mentioned a moment ago, is that the same in your company? Uh, if it's anywhere near that, think about marginal gains, because where they say if you increase anything by 1% or 10%, if you're a, a FTSE 100 company, for example, a 1% or 10% improvement it means a dramatic increase in revenue. And that, that's just me as a tech writer, the way I see it. Um, so thank you. So let me pick up here. Please. <laughs> and just, just to set some context, my first professional job was selling records and tapes. So, really yeah. Cool. So, uh, but, You've come but, a long way, baby. <laughs> one small step. <laughs> but when we think about kind of that, the value of that data in your organization, the, within Aptis, we think about an intelligence capability model. And the foundation of that model is really descriptive intelligence. This is essentially the charts and dashboards that help you understand what's happened in the business from a historical point of view. And this is literally the foundation because without this picture you don't know how you're achieving the business outcomes that are important to the organization, but you also can't use that as a benchmark to track future improvement. Where should I intervene and what should I expect as a performance improvement? So I've got these and if we click forward, I've got these kind of charts. I can begin to measure the contracting function Right? all the various parts of that process and the stakeholders involved in that. And if I have access to that data, so I think in the analogy, right, we used to have to scroll through the tape to get to a specific song. Now I can just, as you mentioned, I can cue that yeah. song up instantaneously or it can be recommended for me. And so by having that foundational data, I can move to predictive, so much like a weather prediction, predictive intelligence about my contracting process. This deal is gonna take this long to get through approval. I also have prescriptive. This deal as it is currently configured is risky. I recommend, Elliot, that you either change the terms of this agreement or perhaps you further escalate. So by having enough of that data history and enough of the analytics on top of it, I can begin to provide choices to the user to help information to the user to, to, to lead them to make better choices for the firm or the customer, potentially even themselves. And that's really what sets up the top of that, that capability model, which is cognitive. I, ha I can bring intelligence into this picture that has the ability to understand reason and learn about my contracting process and provide the insights to the organization that will get us to the outcomes that we're looking to. But in many ways, you know, one of the great challenges I think for everybody here in the audience is where that data is coming from. Right? Yeah. And it's particularly relevant when we're dealing with contracts, when we're dealing with legal instruments, because it's not relational databases. Right. They're not numbers. And so the real question is, where does all that come from? And I think that's, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about the value right, that uh, these types of analytics can provide. But when you're looking at uh, this type of a chart, we all have to remember that it's coming out of text-based information. And I think the, what's really changed and is really allowing AI and machine learning to take really the next generation step beyond, let's say, traditional e-commerce or traditional BI is the fact that we now have insight is computers can understand mm -hmm. the syntax, the semantics, and the meaning of documents. They can parse out contracts just like Lauren has done historically, so that they can enable her to do her work more efficiently, and they can enable attorneys now 
to have access directly into those clauses, into those facts in real time. And I think that all of a sudden that sets up a completely different set of capabilities that we can now do. Absolutely. So that fact base provides that understanding, but it gives you an ability to get to the insights. So what are the, what is the standard what is the standard language that I've mm -hmm. used when I look across not just uh, the set of information that I can easily hold in my head, but over a time frame that may span back to when things were actually written in ink with ink ink pens. Um, and so getting that information into one place and then being able to mine that is the key. You know, the one other thing is, can we just go back one? Just yeah, a sure, second? Sure. So that, you know, the interesting thing here also is that there's, a, there's been a lot of talk about cognitive computing, right? And I think another way of talking about that sometimes, which doesn't make it so black box and so scary, is to talk about either analytical insights or analytical intelligence. Because when we go from the understanding of the documents and that content intelligence, we bring it into the app, the CLM, and as now a data set, now we can generate analytical intelligence on top of it. All of a sudden, it starts to make a lot, of, a lot more sense uh, to everybody here. And when we now look at the, the slides that talk about where we're going, right. you can see where that data, where those facts, where those insights are coming from exactly. to really drive that. Yeah, and so to take this conversation, sorry. sorry, Neil, if you could, to take this conversation, <laughs> just, to, just to touch on some yeah. of the key pieces here. We right? didn't so, rehearse the cadence right, <laughs> sorry. We think about the fact base, so I've got a repository, and from there that gives me the ability to start the reporting and analytics based on that, that data set. From there, I can provide information to users to help them in the authoring or negotiation process, whether I'm uh, executing a buy-side contract or a sell-side contract, and integrating that into some of the other solutions that I use, whether that's some of the incentive solutions that I use to drive behaviors from my sellers or my buyers, and, and, then that's, and then with that information all resident in the solution, that's the key for the cognitive intelligence, I agree. right? I agree. Being able to understand those cycles and mine them for additional insight. And I, I think it, it goes back to something you said earlier as well, is this, this transition from descriptive to predictive and prescriptive, this is the revolution that we're about to live, right? It's the ability not simply to get traditional BI, not simply get re reporting, but now actually, it's a little bit like the sessions I was sitting in about Max, right? Yeah. Now all of a sudden, Aptis, right, with this new technology, can start inserting itself and providing recommendations for things that attorneys have been looking to do for a long time, right? And let's, you know, some yeah, of that so, is we're seeing so coming. The driver behind this, gentlemen, is that it's not a buzzword. That's true also. Like KPIs, that's, that's a buzzword now, right? It means different things to different people. Um, artificial intelligence, AI, we've heard about that for, for some time and it, you know, prior to working on these kinds of projects, I had a different understanding of what it was. What you're really doing is you're elevating the intelligence across the entire process. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing, quote, to cash is elevated by the information you have. So you know, whether we call it cognitive insights, whether we call it analytics, what you're really doing is just elevating um, the experience. You make a great point, and one worth expanding on. When you talk about elevating that insight across quote to cash, we started talking about contract data. Mm -hmm. But remember, I'm trying to make decisions about this deal for this customer, and I want to take into account my history, my organization's history with this customer. Not, and not simply with that customer, but with similar customers within right. either similar cognate or potentially you know, emerging. Right. So I can take insights about how I've performed contractually across my customer base and bring that to bear in decisions that I'm making with this customer on this deal. And that's particularly powerful. We can also reach out to data that sits outside of that, right? So maybe I've got a, a service organization that goes out and delivers and I want to understand some of the customer health and some of the cases associated with that. I can pull that data into that fact base and begin to really leverage insights across the entire relationship with the customer. So the only thing I, I would add on to that is, you know, it's, especially as we start to look at these types of capabilities, is that once again, everybody, you know, traditionally when we talk about artificial intelligence and the machine learning transformation, it, it's dependent upon big data. What we're dealing with here is we're dealing, it's not big data, it's not even big content, right? You could have 
several thousand contracts, that's different than the type of transactions going through Amazon or going sure. through other e-commerce sites. And so it really then depends on what the, you know, what we can actually pull out of those documents to provide that that levels that database, and the more granular and the more insightful, whether it becomes facts or relationships, mm -hmm. right? Or in, in the sense, you know, say clause identification, that then feeds, right, the, the machine learning that then drives these types of capabilities. Exactly. Yeah, and so what we're looking at here is a picture of a clause recommender. So this is for that user who's actually putting together a contract with a customer, whether, or, or a, a vendor, and maybe I'm actually negotiating and I'm looking at some red line and so I can start with, hey, here's what the clause was initially, here's the red lines being offered up by my business partner, here's some insights on appropriate levels of response. So I've got fallback clauses or, a pro, or a, a recommended wording and I've got some metrics, again, that are helping me understand, hey, this one's preferred, it gives you a risk level that is acceptable, if you start moving away from that preferred version, you're going to be increasing your exposure to risk. That's right. And I have to say that this is what clients have been asking for. So I've been working with Aptos since 2013, and, and every time you talk about where the legal department or a general counsel wants to go, it's always directly into that use case. And it's been very difficult for some companies to get to that point. So this is you know, a really good example of Aptus listening and taking that solution and trying to figure out a way to make it kind of fit into what you're doing as opposed to saying that you, know, you have to take this 10 step process in order to get there. And it's, and it's a world beyond where the e-discovery market was. I mean, one of the, it, it's kind of interesting as I've been walking around uh, the conference yesterday and today, there's been a lot of people that actually have been migrating from that universe into the CLM type universe. And yet, what we're talking about here is not review. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not, it's, I mean, part of it can be, you know, there's a data migration component, but at right. the end of the day, it's the value that we're going to drive, whether it's from yep. legacy contracts, whether it's from the text of existing contracts, or as you have here, and I think the this has time. been something we've been after for a long time, it's third party paper. Being able to get an alien contract, mm -hmm. something you've never seen before, and have Aptis automatically break that out in, into clauses, allow you to do the sort of comparison, the recommendations, um, and then drive, you know, drive the efficiency, but also drive the accuracy of your process, that, that speaks directly to the bottom line of practicing attorneys. Exactly, it's a support mechanism, it's a supporting set of information for that attorney, mm -hmm. so that help them understand more and get to an appropriate solution or decision right. faster. The other thing about speed though is remember, in any organization, right, whether you're buying or selling, it's always set against time. It's a bit of a race. And so understanding how you help achieve a goal by a given time or a specific time is absolutely key. And of course, within the solution, we can measure every step of the process against time to say, hey, if you accept this version of this clause, it's likely to impact your timeline in these ways. And so here we're looking at a picture of literally a clause recommender that's showing time, estimated time, based on the organization's performance in the past. So here we're looking at cycle time prediction. We can expand that around uh, compliance prediction. Again, we can tie into those uh, fulfillment data sets to understand whether or not you've actually lived up to your commitments. Um, and then we can do things like clause library, which is more foundational, which gets us started in this process. Okay, why don't we go to the next slide? All right, so my this message is, is, even in the world's best setup of how a machine can learn, what I've learned from these gentlemen is ma machines don't read contracts the way that humans do. They go about it in a different way, and when they read those things, there are going to be times that a human eyeball still needs to judge that. Um, so computers, they can be taught a great number of things. They can do chess, they can do Jeopardy. God knows they can navigate a whole lot better than I can. <laughs> but they can't do karate, right? And they, they, they can't bake a cake. So we not need to always balance the productivity that you're gaining, the speed at which you do it, but also the scalability. So as an example, when we go through this process, everyone who's seen a contract knows that lawyers can get very creative in the way a provision is written. 
we can look at one provision for termination and know exactly what it's supposed to say. Ah, termination for cause or termination for convenience. We can look at that same provision in a different contract and not know which end is up simply based on the syntax or you know maybe it's a translated from a different language. That's where the human element is always going to come in. So while this isn't a one-step process, what it does is takes the 10-step process that you have and puts five of those processes in super speed, right? So the other five steps are still done and they're still done based upon what you need and where you are on your scale. Um, when we do encapsulate the entire process and using machine learning and using Aptus and getting to that enterprise CLM program, um, we have to remember to in include the machine's ability to, to learn what it is that you already inherently know. And that's the step that sometimes people miss or as we talk about AII and as it's been released, it seems to be something that's a little fuzzy. Yeah, I think you know the interesting thing is um, uh, point well taken, right? There, there, there's the role of people in this process will never go away. I think what, what we're seeing though is the data and the insight that are now provided uh, to whether it be you know, yourself as we're working with these data sets or attorneys as they're working with contracts, that's undergoing a qualitative transformation. Agreed. So while there's never a one-to-one -one match in what a computer will understand with a practicing lawyer, the fact of the matter is that there is a high level of understanding that actually over time right, is built up such that the information provided is so much more granular and so much more targeted that the accuracy and efficiency goes up a qualitative level. We touched on AII, or we mentioned AII. I don't know that we necessarily provided a definite. Uh, they don't even need know what AII is. So we need to we need to double click on that. Do you want to? Do you want to take a cut at that? You want me to take I'd a cut at that? I'd be happy to, okay. but you've got to keep me honest here, okay. Elliot. So, <laughs> Aptus Intelligent Import, that was the first component that was launched related to um, the next step in machine learning and the partnership for how machine learning impacts your use of Aptus. And everybody who's got CLM, whatever CLM you have, you usually don't have that system the first day you're open for business, right? So you always have to answer the question, what are you going to do if the first day you use Aptus, somebody needs to amend a contract that's not there? How are you going to get that legacy information to the system? And this has been a consistent issue for every client who has any CLM system. And so we needed a way to get migration past the point that it had been at. And you know, I've migrated a number of systems into another, uh, a, a number of other systems, and I do it through a Nancy Drew type method, right? I'm, I'm looking at the metadata, I'm extrapolating, I'm translating records, I grab my SQL developers, I have them figure it out. It's a long, hard process. But here, you're taking things like machine learning, the text analytics, the ability to parse out that contract, identifying the attributes that are ready for Aptus, like they are the Aptus attributes in so many cases, and you're combining it with some of the best technology, like XAuthor for Excel, to get those records into your system quicker, quickly. And so that's the first step, and maybe what you can do to put you on the spot, Elliot, sure. is tell them a little bit about where it's going next. Yeah, so exactly, so again, <clears throat> once I have that data, whether it's the metadata associated with that contract or the actual text of, uh, represents the clauses and terms, it's from there that we can begin to generate the recommendations about redlining, reconciling third-party paper, delivering those insights to the user inside the app, the CLM experience. You know, one of the, uh, I, I know, Lauren, I know you mentioned migration, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's, uh, we should also remember that this is also, it, it's a bit of an ongoing process. That is, as people evolve their practice uh, and they identify additional uh, insights or facts or relationships that they want out of the contracts, they, we can actually go back, pull that information right. out to drive the next generation. So I, I really see this as a, you know, we're just at the beginning. We, we, we kind of know where we're going over the next year or two together, but where it ultimately goes to is what the users in the market sure. will actually tell us in terms of what they want 
uh, out of those contracts. Where the so, value is and the, right. the efficiency, the effectiveness gains. So I do think we're getting close to time here, but just to share where things are going next, and, and maybe Neil, you can help us a little bit about anything cool that's going on with artificial intelligence in general, um, is recognize that the theme for today was the rise of the machine. So we're not trying to turn into Cyberdyne systems, um, any of us, right? Um, Skynet is a cautionary tale in, liter in the literary sense. So we always need to remember that and, and avoid that self-awareness, right? Absolutely, I mean, there is a lot of fear around this. I think there was a lot of fear around this technology, but I think now we're noticing that there's more opportunities than challenges. Rightly or wrongly, we now have Samsung fridges or any smart fridge that will tell you when your milk is running out at home. So businesses need to step up and deliver that same experience. So can you do things faster? Can you do things easier? And can you do things better? This is our expectation at home, and I think that is going to be our expectation at work too. I find my best shoes by looking at the Amazon. What did other people buy? <laughs> Fantastic. Time to renew the milk subscription, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>